In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. May the Lord bestow upon us his blessing, mercy, grace, and wisdom now and ever into the age, while well, ages, amen. Uh, welcome back, everyone. We're starting a new series uh, during this great Lent uh, this year, God willing, and we decided um, to study uh, a book that is actually dear to my heart uh, for many years, but uh, I've been very reluctant to, to study this, um, as you will see. <laughs> um, so we wish you all a blessed start of the, the Great Lent. It's a time of spiritual growth and retreat and to spend more time with our, our Lord, less time with the worldly distractions. Um, and so I thought it would be very appropriate um, to study the book of the Song of Solomon, <clears throat> um, in which the theme is very similar, as we'll see, to, to spend our time with our beloved and heavenly bridegroom. Um, so today we'll take you, God willing, um, to uh, through a quick uh, introduction of the book, and we'll jump into the first few verses uh, of the first chapter. <clears throat> so um, as we go into the book, or as we see how the book is structured, there's eight chapters. And so we thought, again, it was appropriate for the eight weeks of, of the Lent to, to study this, try to cover more than a chapter in the coming weeks, just so that we can end uh, on the appropriate time. Um, and like I said, this book focuses on the love of God and the love that we should have for God, right? <clears throat> um, and before, we get into the book, just some people uh, like to know what the resources that are out there that we could use, especially the Orthodox ones. So here's just a, a quick um, summary of the main resources that we're planning to use. Um, so the top three are from the church fathers um, or selections of the church fathers. I think the, the most um, uh, complete a version that we have from one of the fathers from A to Z, uh, at least that I could find out there right now, is from the scholar Origen. There are other fathers who did write, but we don't have um, a lot of their complete um, uh, commentaries out there. And even if we do, a lot of them are not translated in English or very easily accessible uh, to the general public. So that's why we focused on this one. And then from the contemporary fathers, we have His Holiness uh, Pope Shenouda of Blessed Memory. Um, he gave several lectures uh, on this um, early in his, his papacy. And there's one, um, I think that this middle um, uh, contemplations from the Song of Songs might be a little more complete because it has a more a detailed introduction. Um, uh, but on the other side, the translation, I believe, in, in this first one on the bottom left, is, is a little more um, uh, the translation is a little more easily to, uh, more, more accurate. Okay, and then finally we have Abuna Tedros Melati, uh, who um, who did commentaries on, on the entire uh, book of script, books of scripture. Um, and uh, there's more than one edition of, of his commentary here. So uh, hopefully you can find them and um, easily access them or even purchase a hard copy if you like. So before we go into that, <laughs> this is basically um, scripture as a whole, Old Testament and New Testament, uh, mainly the Old Testament, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, easy to remember, um, there are five, twelve, five, five, twelve, and then the second canon, right? So there's five books of Monas, which is the law, right? Twelve books of the history, five books of the poetry, of which Tongue of Solomon is, is the, the last here at least mentioned, uh, with not including the Dura canonical, and then five major prophecies, twelve minor prophecies, and then um, the uh, continuation of the canon uh, that unfortunately um, the Jewish scripture does not uh, contain for various reasons, and even some Christians don't accept all of those books. Um, <clears throat> but as you'll see, this is one of the poetic books. And three of these poetic books, if, uh, mentioned here at least, um, and four if you count the Deuterocanonical, are written by uh, King Solomon, right? Because there's Wisdom of Solomon as well. <clears throat> um, and um, 
just by the way, though, the, uh, the law, history, poetry, and prophecy, those categories are also found in the New Testament, right? Because the, the law of the New Testament is the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The history of the New Testament is what? Uh, the book of Acts, right? The prophecy of the uh, New Testament is in the book of Revelation. And the poetry, or we could say the book of books of wisdom, which are the epistles, both from St. Paul and the Catholic epistles. Okay, um, but going more deep into um, the books of King Solomon, uh, Origen the scholar has a beautiful contemplation on this. And he says, the three books at least that we find in, in, in the first canon of scripture, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Songs of Solomon, um, take us into three different levels of, of, of reading these poet, poetic books. One focuses on the morality, as he says, or the moral science, the, which is the book of Proverbs. And it talks about, um, it's, it's kind of geared more towards, towards the mental aspect or the strive for, for wisdom. And um, in order to be wise, as he says, you have to develop the discipline of obedience to strive for the practical holy life, right? And then he says, after you get from that first basic level, it's not basic, but the, the introductory level, you go to the next step, which is understanding nature and the things around you and the world as a whole, and realizing that a lot of this stuff is superfluous, or it is... Um, it's, it's not beneficial for, for my growth, my spiritual growth and my relationship with God. And we say, that's vanity, that's emptiness. Um, and I can do, do without those things, right? <clears throat> and that's why in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a lot of repetition of uh, vanity, all is vanity, right? And then um, as Origen says, we go to the, to the holy of holies of, of, of these books, um, which goes to the, to focuses on the heart or the contemplative life or um, lifting our minds and our hearts towards heaven. Um, and what's more deeper than going into the depth of our love relationship with God. <clears throat> and, and so um, Origen says, these are like the three same levels um, of virtue uh, as Abraham who was strong in faith and Isaac, who, who sacrificed um, himself, right? And then the higher level, Jacob, um, not that he was higher than Abraham, but he came last, right? And he was the one who, um, who uh, grew or, or exemplified um, that he had the, the vision of the ladder to heaven, right? Um, <clears throat> so he's saying you can't go to the to the third book first, you have to start in the, in the spiritual growth until you can get to um, this book, right? <clears throat> and love renews all things, right? As St. Paul says, uh, uh, quoted by Origen, um, he said, knowledge puffs up, which is kind of like the, the first step, right? Knowledge and wisdom, but love, love edifies, love builds um, up. Um, so that's why we'll see that um, uh, in not this slide, but the next slide, that uh, the, the church, and even from the early days in the, the Old Testament, um, Jewish tradition was that you couldn't read this book early on. Um, you, you, there has to be some maturity, um, physically, mentally, spiritually, before you can um, even start to study this book. Um, and we'll get into that in two minutes. But the theme of this book is the heavenly bridegroom, our Lord Jesus Christ, and his bride. And um, when we say his bride, there's more than one uh, type or symbol here. Um, one is the church at large, right? Another one is the soul. Um, we have a personal relationship with our Savior, right? Outside or in addition to the, the church collectively, all the souls together, right? I feel this relationship personally, um, even though he has come and he has loved all humanity. Um, <clears throat> and then the third level is to apply this in our relations with others, um, not just our uh, uh, 
the husbands and wives out there, but the, the practical application of the, the heart that is filled with love. What, what does that heart do? And what does that heart think? Um, uh, and how do they apply? How does the one filled with love um, ap apply that in their daily life, right? So the scholar origin says, um, the names of bride and bridegroom denote either, so this is just a summary of what I just said, either the church in relation to Christ, the bride is the church, Christ is the bridegroom, as St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter five, or the soul in its union with the word of God, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So these symbols are very important. And these types are very important because we don't take this book literally. <laughs> I'll repeat again, we don't take this book literally. And, and this is why, you know, <laughs> a, a lot of um, uh, scholars or even church fathers out there say, uh, be careful when you study this book. Um, and so, I, like I said, I was reluctant to, st to study this book, but I thought, well, it, it's actually more important to study it so that no one will go studying this on their own, especially if they're not uh, ready. Um, and so, like I said, th this book is easily misunderstood because there's a lot of symbols and a lot of types um, and the style is, is figurative and not literal. So it's not for beginners. It's not for people who are still stuck um, in the vanity of the world, right? Um, or things of the flesh, because it will talk about things of the flesh, but only for the purpose of directing our hearts and our minds towards heaven. So if we haven't started in the spiritual life well, we're going to get um, confused. Um, and, and for the younger ones as well, um, uh, or those who are worried about this, we say, okay, stick with, uh, like His Holiness Pope Shenouda of Blessed Memory says, stick with a guide um, instead of reading it on your own. Um, even in the, <laughs> the, the Jewish um, rabbis used to say, you're not allowed to read this <laughs> until you're 30 years old, <laughs> right? Um, but we say, at least like His Holiness says, um, when those who live according to the Spirit read this book, their love for God will increase. The whole purpose is for us, our love for God to grow. But if you're living according to the flesh, you need a guide while reading it. Um, and so we take the Holy Spirit and the Church Fathers as our guide, um, and um, even we won't read everything verse by verse, but we'll take the general understanding and explain the symbols that might uh, trip us up. <clears throat> um, and so um, this is just a, a quick uh, disclaimer for us. Um, and, and it's, like I said, it's best for the younger children to study it first with a servant or with a guide, or maybe in, in this um, a study um, before opening and just reading on. It's, it's one of the few books where we have to do this uh, in scripture. Um, and also, in addition to that, you might need your father of confession, uh, blessing or permission uh, to read this. So, <clears throat> um, but nevertheless, it's still a very beautiful and important book in which, like we said, like Jacob, we ascend with our hearts and our minds into the heavenly things. <clears throat> As uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa says, uh, in this book, the word commands us not to think of carnal matters, even if we are in the flesh, but to ascend in the spirit. Um, so that all the love expressions that we, we read about are like pure offerings presented to the good Lord. We don't want to stain our minds with the worldly things, um, but just as a symbol to, to ascend um, with, with God, thinking and contemplating about the heavenly things, not the worldly things. Um, and then we find all of our sweetness, all of our love, all our desire is found in our beloved Lord. Okay. Um, so with that, let's go into some of the uh, symbols and types before even entering. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> um, the main two figures here is actually, as Origen describes it, is more like um, a play or a drama, um, because you have many characters coming in and out, even within the same verse or in the same chapter. Um, so it, it, we have to be careful as, as, as we uh, discern who is speaking to whom um, and, and, and why. So most Bibles out there do kind of put um, uh, a, a caption before whom is speaking so that we know. Um, but nevertheless, um, who is the king that we're speaking of? We know it's Solomon, and I'll get to that in a minute. And there's someone called the Shulamite woman. Um, 
who is a simple country girl. Again, this is a story. It's not necessarily um, something that truly happened. We can't prove that per se. Um, but if we go back to what I was just saying about the symbolism, um, that's what we focus on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there is a king, King Solomon, who was the son of a king, right? See the symbolism here. He also appears in the first chapter as a shepherd, even though we don't know of King Solomon being a shepherd at all, right? And he meets this simple country girl who is working for him in the vineyard. What does a shepherd have to do in the vineyard? Well, the good shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ, is taking care of the vineyard, which is the church. So here we see the symbols very clearly if, if we jump um, past the literal explanation, right? What does Solomon mean? It, he has two names, King Solomon. Um, Solomon, which means peace, and Jedediah, which means beloved of the Lord, which is very similar to David, right? Um, so here we see the king of peace, right? Who is the beloved, right? Um, and he is the son of the king, the king of the king. Um, <clears throat> who else can this be symbolic of uh, uh, other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right? Who has met this poor girl, but he loved her, right? And he, um, he desires to marry her. And even the word Shulamite is, is reflective of Solomon. It's, it's an, another, a female name for Solomon um, in, in the, the Jewish language, right? And it means the one who received peace. So who, who else could that be except for the church and, and, and us, right? Because we receive it from the king of peace, right? So <clears throat> um, again, this is proving what we're saying of how this is not to be taken literally, okay? Um, the next part here. Um, uh, what does the book look like? Um, different scholars, as, as usual, divide up the eight chapters differently, but I thought this might be um, more appropriate of um, how mentally you can think of well, what comes first, first courtship and then engagement and then the marriage and happy, living happily ever after, right? So um, that's kind of the progression here. Um, with the exception of maybe the, the, the wedding reception. Um, and I'll, I'll go more into detail of what betrothal and the difference between betrothal and the wedding um, when we get further into the chapter. But as we know, like with the Holy Virgin Mary and, and St. Joseph the carpenter, th there was a period of time where they were betrothed but not married. Um, even though legally she was considered, she had the same um, legal rights as, as the wife, um, which, which shows um, uh, the, the relationship with the believer and, and the Lord, okay? Um, and we'll get into that, right? So, so we can say the first two chapters are basically about the, the, when they first met and when they're preparing themselves for the marital life. And the second two chapters are more relating to um, the commitment Right? And, and the preparation for wedding, the, the deeper preparation for wedding after deciding, okay, this is the one for me. And then finally we see, okay, how do they live happily ever after? There's a, there's a, a celebration. There is a change within the person and they become more like each other. And then they speak words of love to, to each other, not just before we their med wedding, um, but throughout the rest of their life. And then they live happily ever after. So this is kind of a good structure of, of how we see the, the book to be divided into. We start falling in love or knowing the person better. Then we live in love and committing ourselves to one another. And then we grow in love, um, ascending from, from the worldly things to, to the, the, the more important things, right? So this can be applied to uh, how two people uh, um, grow in their, in their knowledge and love for one another until they're married and live happily ever after. But more importantly, th th this applies to how we get to know Christ and to commit ourselves to living a Christian life and how we live happily uh, forever with him, not just in this world, but in the one to come. Okay, so hopefully that gives uh, you a good um, breakdown of, of what is to come. Right, so um, let's jump into um, the word of scripture, but we might take a little bit longer this time. So we 
uh, train our senses in, in how to um, how to deal with this book, okay, or or how to apply it in in our understanding, okay. So <clears throat> first verse, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, okay. So obviously this is written by Solomon, <laughs> right? Um, and we don't need to uh, prove the authority of this or uh, the. Or, or take too much time. There's plenty of proof on this um, if, if, you, if you need resources for this. But um, another name for this book is not just Song of Solomon, but Song of Songs. Um, and why is this important? Um, if we know the, the life of King Solomon, um, he wrote th about 3,000 proverbs and he wrote over 1,000 songs. Um, if you can see that in First uh, Kings chapter four, um, but when he says that song of songs, he's like, "This is the one above all, right?" Just like when we say, "He is Lord of Lords," or "He is King of Kings," or "This is the Holy of Holies," right? Basically, King Solomon is saying, "Out of all the things that I wrote, this is the top." <laughs> um, and so he's—it's a bold statement, and that's why he starts with it, right? And um, so it, even if you look at different uh, uh, translations of, of scripture. Sometimes um, the title of the book is Song of Solomon, and sometimes it's Song of Songs. Um, this is what the Jews um, used to call it. Um, again, taken from the first uh, couple of words uh, in the Jewish language of the book. Um, so um, the title uh, supports the idea that um, King Solomon is the, the author of the book. And most likely he wrote it early in his reign um, based on what we know from um, the locations that he talks about when there was still um, not too much separation between the north and the south part of the country. As we see after King Solomon, you know, things get the, the, the country and the kingdom it becomes divided, right? Um, and, uh, and during this time, there was relative peace and good relations uh, with, with um, the different areas that he talks about, as well as Egypt and, and the other uh, surrounding countries like Lebanon, okay? Um, so um, just in addition to that, um, to let you know from the history, um, even some of the Jewish rabbis in, around the time of our Lord Jesus Christ tried to exclude this book from scripture. Why? Because they were taking it literally. And they said, this, this, this book has no place in scripture. Um, <clears throat> but um, as we know, the canonicity um, or the uh, authenticity of scripture was supported by the first council of, uh, the council of Jamnia um, in, the, in the first, in, uh, the, the end of the first century. Um, so it didn't happen, it was kept in scripture. Um, and on top of that, it was read on the eighth day after the celebration of uh, Passover, because this is when we recite the song of love of our beloved who uh, gave himself for um, his people um, and shed his blood <laughs> through them. So um, the eighth day re refers, as we know, to, um, to the eternal life. Um, and so this book is related to the eternal life. So even if we go over um, into uh, the eighth day, or to uh, if if the study um, spills over to the holy fifty days, it's still very appropriate. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, th this is uh, the first uh, verse, that, uh, and um, uh, Origen, the scholar, again writes: This book deserves to be placed before all other songs, for apparently the other songs. He, and here he says includes the other parts of scripture, like we're going the law and the prophets um, were recited for the bride or the Old Testament church when she was still a little girl, still not matured in the faith, right? And had not yet crossed the threshold of a mature age. But this song is recited for her when she has grown up quite strong and now able to receive the adult power and perfect mystery. So again, the idea here is this book is for the mature. Um, and if not, we, we have a, a guide to bring us to um, a little level of maturity so that we can uh, hear these, uh, this 
this inti these intimate words exchanged between uh, the bride and the groom um, in the proper uh, or appropriate uh, uh, understanding. Okay. Um, so <laughs> next verse, right? Um, the the bride. So this is not a mature. Uh, th this is a mature statement of someone who knows the the groom and wants to hurry up. And so basically, what happens in the story is that she gets to know him. She falls falls in love with him, and he leaves for, to to go about doing his business. And and she's waiting for him to return. She's like, I can't. She can't stand this anymore. I need. I need to marry him, <laughs> right? So she says, "Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love. Your love is better than wine." Um, and from the get go, we see that again, it, it can't be um, taken literally because um, she's saying, "Let him kiss me, uh, for your love is better than wine." Um, so obviously, this is a prayer directed to the Holy Trinity, right? Um, as Abuna Tadras Meliti writes, this book is for the mature who have tasted his love. So I have tasted the love of God. Had, I have had my heart inflamed by it. And I accept the love which has emanated from the cross. Um, and I wanna live meditating on the love of God, right? And uh, Origin also says, <clears throat> because the bridegroom delays his coming for so long, she grieved with longing for his love. Sometimes in our spiritual life, we feel that God is far from us, but we know God loves us and we love him, but we don't feel this intimacy uh, always um, at every moment, e even though we long for it, right? So he says this here, the, the soul or the person brings herself to prayer and make supplication to God, whom she knows to be her bridegroom's father, right? So we're saying, I, I need, either we speak to the father and say, I need the love of the son, right? Or I speak to the son, I need the love of the father, right? And, and the kiss of his mouth, that's, that's scripture. That's, that's the, the, the words of love that we hear from the word of God comes from the mouth of God, right? Um, and so we say, your love is better than wine. Your, the love of God is better than the, the, pa the passing pleasure of the world, right? The, again, um, this is said by the one who is mature, who already realized the vanity of the world and say, I want to go deeper in the love of God. You know, your love is much better than all that, all that other stuff out there, right? <clears throat> and so, um, again, this shows the, the maturity of the person who, who already passed level one and two, they've grown in wisdom, they've realized the emptiness of the things that don't pertain to God, and they want to go deeper in, in their love and understanding of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, and so uh, the next verse says, because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment point, poured forth, right? And um, here the word ointment is in reference to the word chrism, and the word chrism comes uh, from is the same root as the, the name of Christ, right? So we're saying, you are the anointed one, you are the Christ, and and this has to do with your name, right? Um, and uh, Saint Ambrose explains it better by saying, having embraced the word of God, the Christ, the soul, or I desire Him above every beauty. Um, she loves him above every joy. She is delighted with him above every perfume. She wishes often to see, often to gaze, often to be drawn to him that she may follow him. Okay, so the bride is, um, is uh, engrossed with the love of God, right? And um, say even just the name is, is uh, like sweet smelling oil pour pouring forth from him. Um, and uh, humanity has known the name of Christ, um, the Savior of the world, and, and through the cross we realize that the salvation is and, and reconciliation is coming uh, from him and from his sacrifice and from his offering. Um, and that's why you say your name is, is ointment poured forth. Um, and so um, 
St. Augustine uh, contemplates and says, you know, uh, this sweet fragrance um, is reminding us of the aroma of Christ that St. Paul talks about. <clears throat> and this aroma comes from the sacrifice, from the cross. Um, and this cross is what draws our hearts uh, to heaven. Okay. Um, so as you say, there's, there's tons and tons of symbols. We don't have time to go through all of them, but because they are repeated, we can, um, we can go back to some of them that we missed uh, in the next uh, few chapters. <clears throat> so the other thing that we realize here is that sometimes the love is, uh, is proclaimed from the Shulamite woman, which is each one of us. And sometimes um, there's another group called um, the Daughters of Jerusalem, right? Um, and uh, sometimes it's said collectively, we all love you, right? And this is kind of similar as we'll see um, to Matthew 25, the parable of, of the, the, the 10 virgins, right? Who are all being prepared to marry the groom, one groom. It doesn't make sense in, um, if, if we take it literally. But if we say that this collective group is symbolic of all of the souls in the world, then it makes perfect sense, right? And so that there will be no jealousy. I don't, I don't care if other people love my my groom. I don't care if um, we're all running together to to chase the one that we love, um, because he loves each and every one of us, and um, he could marry all of us. <laughs> um, and so that's why we say the church as a whole is also the bride, not just me personally. Okay, and this is again important when when we when we just get to these next few verses, right? We see here um, the going back and forth. So the, the, um, uh, the quotations here in red are from the Shulamite and the ones in black here on the top are um, from the daughters of Jerusalem, right? <clears throat> so, so the Shulamite says, therefore the virgins love you. Say, there's other people here that love you too. It's like, what does she care about that? If, if it was just literally, you know, I would, if that were me, I'd be jealous. I'm like, I don't care about them. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not even going to encourage you to even realize the, everyone else who loves you, right? And then she says, lead me away. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the daughter of Jerusalem said, we will run after you. <laughs> we're going to come with you to, to your bride, your groom, to your groom, sorry. Um, and then she says, okay, I made it. The, the king brought me into his chambers. And we'll get to that in a minute, right? And then the daughters say, we will be glad and we'll rejoice in you. We're going to be happy for you. We're not going to be jealous either, right? Because the same thing is, is awaiting us as well, right? We don't get jealous of the saints whom God loved and who elevated and honored them. Um, on the contrary, we're encouraged that maybe one day I could follow in their footsteps. Um, okay. And God's heart is, is big enough to accept all who come to him, he, it's already um, uh, willing and, and open for all of creation. And so uh, the daughters of Jerusalem continue by saying, we will remember your love more than wine. Same, same idea as what she just said in, in the last verse, right? We don't have to re-explain that. Um, <clears throat> and then she says, rightly do they love you. They, they love you, um, she's talking to the groom, they, they love you and it's, it's meet and right, it's proper um, because I love you too. The only way that this could be appropriate is if we're talking about the symbol, <laughs> okay? And some people say, no, it's Old Testament. You know, um, King Solomon had, you know, many wives, it, that, that was then. Um, but even then, um, what did he write later when he said it's better for you to rejoice in the wife of your youth, not wives. So even he realized after he, he grew in wisdom, it's better to have one. <laughs> so then why would he say, rightly do they love you? Only if we're talking about uh, the, the type or the symbol here of Christ and, and, and his bride, the church. So the bride wants all believers to love her bridegroom, right? There's no jealousy. Um, <clears throat> and St. Augustine says, let us all love him and follow his example. Let us run after his ointments, his, Christ, his, his Christ, right? He came and spread his sweet fragrance all over the world. The aroma of Christ is all over the world. Um, where did the sweet fragrance come from? From heaven. 
Okay. Um, I don't think there's any uh, need to belabor that point. Uh, I think you get the message. <clears throat> and so, well, what does it mean the king has brought me into his chambers? Right? Saint Cyril of Jerusalem, um, who has a very beautiful, um, detailed explanation of, of the catechism and the preparation for, for baptism, which was um, done quite often back then for the, for the adults. He says, this, these chambers refer to the font of baptism. Um, and um, uh, he said, the catechumen, the person preparing for baptism, is united with their bridegroom um, by being buried with him and risen with him um, and begins to carry the new creation. Um, <clears throat> uh, Saint Dim Didymus the Blind also says, the one who created the soul accepts her as a bride in the baptismal font. Um, and so, um, as St. Paul says in the, to, to the Galatians, as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. We become like him. We put on the white. We put on the purity. We put on the birth from on high, and we become, or at least we start to become like Christ from the day of our baptism. And in order to do that, we need to be brought into his chambers. We, um, what is his chamber but the cross? The baptismal font um, can be um, in many different shapes, and one of them is the shape of the cross for that very reason. Um, <clears throat> uh, and we also said uh, eight is important for the new life and the new day um, because the world was created in six days. God rested on the seventh, which included now. And the eighth is reference to the new life in, in heaven. And so sometimes the baptismal font was octagonal. It had eight sides um, for that reason. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the last, we'll go through these last couple of verses and conclude next time, God willing. Um, and again, this can be very easily misunderstood if we're taking it literally. <laughs> so um, uh, even people from you know, the BLM movement will be upset if we say something like this, but this is just figurative, okay? So <clears throat> um, the, the Shulamite says, I am dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem. Like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. <clears throat> okay, um, and again, <laughs> this symbol here is is not for the person who 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 was born with with a dark skin color, but like she explains, um, because I'm working hard outside, I'm tanned, right? Um, and this is symbolic of what? Um, well. Look back in Genesis. What happened in Genesis? Um, one of the punishments of, 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 of sin, of partaking of, of the tree that they shouldn't have, was what? They will work hard um, and sweat, right? Um, and so this is a reminder of the sin, right? We're dark with sin. But then she says, but wait a second, am I dark or lovely? <laughs> she says, I'm dark, I'm both, right? Um, <clears throat> St. Ambrose explains by saying, I am dark with human weakness but perfect through the mystery of faith, dark with sins, but perfect with the grace of God, uh, dark with human nature, perfect with salvation, dark with filth of strife, but perfect when crowned with the close of victory. So as uh, His Holiness Pope Shenouda of blessed memory says, um, the, the mature spiritual person has to realize both sides of the coin. And he says it in a different way, but um, he says, when I, filled with the thoughts of pride, I have to remember that I'm dark, I'm sinful. Um, when I feel hopeless because of my sin, I have to remember the grace and the love that God has for me and how he thinks of me as lovely and beloved, right? <clears throat> so the Christian is constantly tutoring between these two boundaries so that I don't um, be filled with excessive pride, right? And then stumble on, on sin. And on the flip side, I am not stumbled by despair in thinking that there's no hope for me, right? Um, so we have to constantly uh, make sure we're in the proper uh, boundaries here. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, moving on to the next slide, oh, origin, the scholar says, she says, I'm dark like the tents of Kedar but beautiful like the curtains of Solomon. So even these two examples show the extreme, right? So the tents of Kedar, even Kedar means black, but they were black on the outside, similar to the, to the um, 
to the uh, the covering of the t tabernacle in the Old Testament. They were supposed to be um, with animal skin and, and they were a dark because the sun had tanned them, right? <clears throat> um, and uh, this reminds us of, of the, the human weakness, right? Some people say, oh, it's the tabernacle. It should be glorious. It's, it's the, the holy place, right? And the holy of holies is in there. But what's on the outside? It's black, <laughs> Uh, what's on the inside? The beautiful curtains of Solomon. Um, uh, well, Solomon came later in, in, in the temple, um, but they were beautiful uh, fabric and soft and, and colored with red and blue and white and purple. Um, <clears throat> and um, they were very lovely, right? So again, the symbolism, um, I'm a sinner on the outside, but inside I have the grace of God. I have the Holy Spirit. I have the forgiveness of sins. And so um, I accept the, the, the fact that I'm a sinner, but I also accept the fact that God has saved me and given me grace and forgiven me if I continue to remind myself of both things. Um, some uh, theologians or um, other groups of Christians um, go to the, those extremes and that's dangerous. Um, if I say I'm saved by the grace of God, I've already been saved. You could be in danger of falling into pride and living a sinful life. We don't want to do that. Um, or not repenting perfectly or completely, right? And on the flip side, I say, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, a sinner, and there's no hope for me. And who cares if I try to do good? God doesn't want that either, <laughs> right? So that's why we have to remember, I am dark, but lovely. Uh, His Holiness, Pope Shenouda, of blessed memory in his um, uh, contemplations on this book. He has, I think, three or more lectures just on this phrase. Um, and he goes through various examples in scripture and in the lives of the saints who, who had the, the same balance. Um, and uh, even like the Samaritan woman, who was dark, who was not accepted, but lovely on the inside, <laughs> right? Um, and even when she went to proclaim um, her experience with her beloved, um, knowing that she was dark, but she's, but my, my bridegroom is lovely. She brought many people to that bridegroom, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, externally I'm dark, but the soul within um, is, is white. Um, but what about the bridegroom? He's not, he's not dark on the outside, um, as, as we'll see um, <clears throat> in uh, chapter five, the bridegroom is white and ruddy or red, red because he, sh he shed his blood for us, right? So um, again, this, this is how we understand um, uh, these verses. So um, uh, that basically um, co completes the study that we'll have um, uh, in, in the future coming weeks, God willing. Um, and we'll go deeper and deeper oh, unfolding these, these beautiful um, symbols that remind us of our heavenly bridegroom. Um, and I encourage you, God willing, to, to continue studying this. We'll take about one chapter a week, but on your own time, of course, uh, I encourage you to read more than that. Um, um, maybe if, if you're younger or you, you feel it's not appropriate for you to, you can read other books um, or other chapters from other books in, in scripture um, throughout your week. And then we can unfold the rest of um, this book together, um, God willing, uh, the following week. Um, may God give us uh, grace and, and blessing and glory be to him now and forever into the age while we descend.